So, welcome to Keys and Grey, unplugged, relaxed, informal, thoughtful, I think it's fair to say also. Yeah. Um, not starting as we have done the first four or five, a little differently today. We're with you on a daily basis now here on Be In Sports and for our worldwide viewers on YouTube. Briefly, if we can pass a message at this point of significance and we are absolutely serious, please continue to social distance. Mm -hmm. It looks as though it's beginning to have an effect and figures are maybe going in the right way. Um, maybe I'm a little too optimistic, but please, whatever else, stay safe and be responsible. Absolutely. Something I'll get around to in just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, brief selection of newspapers, Andrew. Yes. Um, Gordon Taylor, I will block wage cuts. He doesn't necessarily mean he will be difficult and ensure that employers can't stop deferring wages, uh -huh. or indeed in some cases, stop the wages. The point he makes, I think, is fair. We just don't want anyone taking advantage of this crisis to suit no, their own true. ends. No, that's true. A request for deferral of wages has to be realistic and meaningful and needs due diligence. Players have their own welfare to think At about. At the moment, well. though, have, has there any Premier League club said we are deferring wages? We'd like to defer wages. Newcastle United have said they're not paying staff. Right, OK. But players continue to be paid at the moment. So, so not please stop. Well, if you if you step outside the borders of the UK, of course, Barcelona, yeah. Juventus, yeah. I and mean, a whole host of football clubs and yeah. around around the rest of Europe. Um, uh, Mike Keegan, exclusive here in the Daily Mail, it hadn't been something I had thought about much, but uh, uh, he tells us that Premier League clubs are reconsidering plans to replace their pitchers. Yes, saw this that. Summer. Well, that makes sense because it's it's, it's still uncertain. Mm. They would be, I guess, on in the middle of May, season finishes, bang. Pitches would be dug up, done. But right now, at the middle of May, we don't know where we'll be. And I guess it's too big a risk to put it back later in the year. So I think the vast majority of teams, unless we get in the next month a decision that it's gone, the league's gone, then I think that they won't be doing any relaying of pitches. process takes 50 to 60 days right. to complete and is carried out in time, generally from the end of one season to the start of another in August. Yeah. Um, I'll come back to uh, Jack. UEFA meeting today, Tuesday, our time, to discuss options over the end of football. Uh, it, it, we'll get around to talking about this further in just a moment as well. Matt Critchley, our, 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 our um, sports reporter from the northwest of England, will join us. Um, but I, I think there are leagues now, Andy, where they are going to make a decision. Serie A, I think, will be the first to say... Gone. Well, La Liga must and be following. And it will following. start for me. It will La Liga must follow La Liga very quickly follow. on the back. But who, can I ask who makes that? Who would make that final decision? Right, UEFA, I guess, cover the obvious. It's yeah. Europe. But who makes it? Who makes the decision? Could UEFA say we're, we're stopping these seasons and FIFA going? No, you're not. Not yet. I suppose they could, but I can't imagine a scenario where that would happen. Okay. Fifty-five different nations are going to be talking to Chefrin today who's given an interview to La Repubblica in uh -huh. uh, Italy. He said, right now there's plan A, B and C. We can start in May, in June, or at the end of June. If we can't do it on any of those three dates, then the season probably would be lost. OK, there we go then. Probably would be lost. Yeah. There is also the possibility to finish the season at the start of next season. Mm, I don't like that. I don't like that. With next season starting a little late. It would have to work with respect to the players I like it. and, of course, the complication of signing periods and sponsors. Something else that occurred to me, I, I left yesterday. Um, as, as we reset, and, and, and this was a subject we discussed a lot yesterday, um, I, I would like football to become a little more responsible in the areas of sponsorship as well. That football, the game itself, is a prisoner to betting companies uh, it, it is in the true. UK true. is totally and utterly true. wrong. Uh, we discussed wages yesterday. Mm -hmm. This I noticed on Twitter. Uh, from a gentleman in Spain. I'm in love with a Spanish biologist who was pressed by the media about why it was taking her so long to find a cure for coronavirus. She responded, you give athletes a million pounds a month, a million euros a month, and biologists 1,800. Go ask Cristiano Ronaldo to find a cure. And by the way, Cristiano's not taking a million a month. <laughs> <laughs> Trust she, me, she is being he's not taking a million ironic, of course. Money. But the point, yes, the point is made. Follows on from what we were discussing yesterday. Point is a graphic one. Yeah. Does it not? It's a graphic one. Um, Manchester City face a three hundred and sixty-six million pound loss, wiped off their squad's value if the season isn't 
restarted. This according to a football observatory calculating the total player transfer value in mm -hmm. Europe's big five leagues would decrease by 28% from 29 billion to 21 billion. Ah, what a blow. And they estimate City would stand to lose the most, a 30% drop of 366 million from 1.21 billion to 844 million. They go on to spoil the story by saying uh, Manchester United, for instance, would see Paul Pogba's value almost halved. Well, I, I think he's done that himself. I think he? he's done a pretty good job, Paul. I don't, yeah. I don't yeah. think we need... No, I don't think we, we need any confirmation need of that. Yeah. that. Um, we also yesterday had a slight disagreement about restarting and whether players would require time to adjust to a restart. Um, being me, you would have expected me to go away and start making some inquiries, yes. which I did, yes. of medical staff, let's put it mm -hmm. like that, top-end mm -hmm. medical staff. Whether, whether clubs, coaches want to listen to what medical staff have got to say on this subject is another matter entirely. But this is the best medical advice. Um, response to a question yesterday from a, a, a senior medical expert working within football. Uh, I would say there would be some insurance issues if you threw players straight into games if they haven't trained as a group for a couple of months and they got injured. Between now and the summer, he says, if we restart, he thinks a group the squad would need two to three weeks to readjust to playing mm -hmm. again. Two to three weeks. I don't disagree. Add that to the time that we require to even think about starting and then ultimately finishing. Uh, he says after that, four to six weeks. Um, he went on to say big injuries like cruciates, which you could expect if you restart cold. Big injuries like cruciates could potentially be, attrib potentially be attributed to the lack of training, loss of strength, and could lead right, first and foremost, to legal action. First and foremost, on that, just quickly. I'm not suggesting for a minute starting cold. Never did. What I'm saying is the players are of a level of fitness. They've had a couple of weeks. So many times we've heard, let's have a pre-season break, mid-season break. Great, refresh the lads, get them going again, back into the, the season, fresh, ready to go again, kick on. No problem. What I'm saying is, Rich, what I've always said is, because they have or have had their own fitness schedule since we stopped playing, they're still ticking over. Now, a pre-season normally is something like four, five weeks. That's a pre-season, right? Mm. To get ready for the season. So why do we, they, well, they don't need four or five weeks. Well, you I'm say saying. that. What I'm saying is, if you are starting in the, let's say the middle of June, hypothetically, 12th, 14th of June, we're going to kick off. I think if there was, if the, the group of players had two weeks on top of what they've we've been doing at home, in isolation, then that would be enough, in my opinion, to get us off and running again. You say that, and that, you, you uh, listen, I wouldn't argue with any of that, but at the same time, Paul Wilson here in The Guardian mm -hmm. saying Premier League players will be told to stop training amid doubts over a restart. Well, they might be, but that doesn't do them any harm either. We've heard that before. Have a couple of weeks off, reset, get there, and then they'll tick over again. Now, I know it's going to be difficult, but as I said yesterday, these are unusual circumstances. We, we've never known anything like that and hopefully never will again. So we're going to have to expe expect that players are not going to be 100%. They might not be 90%. They might be 80%, so then 75%. With what integrity do you restart a league where everybody finished at, at, at high-end intensity but they and fitness? But they didn't. Because we finished with some players out of the team. Manchester United finished with Paul Pogba injured. They might, fi they might start with Paul Pogba. This is the road finished. we went down yesterday. I yes. understand what you're saying. That, that you're talking about individual fitness issues for certain players. But I'm that, talking about the group. I'm talking about the majority in a group of 25, 23, were at peak levels of fitness when we stopped. Well, that, there that, are individual examples, players well, that, that weren't. That, but that, but that, that becomes But then they're all the issue. same, but it's still a level playing field. No one's got an advantage. What I'm saying is, we don't have Manchester City, who have had all the players in training, right now, who have kept their levels of fitness, and Aston Villa, for instance, who have allowed their players to train at home, that's not happening. They're all, pl they're all playing well, they're from all the same... Now. Yeah, the but they're United all playing the last from the same... Shut down, no one's they? got an advantage, is what I'm saying. No team has, has an advantage. It might not be perfect. I'm, I'm only suggesting this, if they want the league finished, then we're going to have to accept that the players are not going to be 100%, but they're never 100% in August. Mm. They're never 100% Here's a story August. we did not discuss yesterday for legal reasons. Um, what, what we were expecting to happen subsequently has. Yeah. The individual has taken ownership. Let me ask you in this manner. If you're going to be a top 
top player, do you have to eat, sleep, breathe, study, live the right way with a, a hunger that is unquestioned? And is that why Jack Grealish is 24, still at Aston Villa, and got one or less caps? Because he's not of the right sort. No, I, I believe he is the right sort. I think he made a mistake. I think he made a big error of judgment, massive error of judgment. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, today, as he sits in his home, where he will be, uh, he's reflecting on a, a, a moment of stupidity, gross stupidity. I'm really disappointed because you know what I feel about Jack Grealish. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan, I'm a massive fan. I've watched the kid grow up because he plays at a club and in an area I live and in a club that I played for and have an affinity to. And yes, when he was 18, 19, he had one or two issues, but it never bothered me because most players do. Most players do. I thought he comes from a good family. He really does, Richard. Um, he seems to me to have matured and grown up in the last two or three years. Uh, how he's only got one cap for England, I don't know, because he's an unbelievably good footballer. But he has made a massive error of judgment here as a 24-year-old. Is the key, you see, I, I had my doubts. This year I have grown more to enjoy him and, and in line with your opinion of him. But, but, but the last 48 hours I've come back to playing. Yeah, interesting. It's unusual. Yeah, uh, I've come back to thinking, how are you 24? and still at Villa. How, how, if you are a genuine football talent, have you only got one England cap? There is something there, Andy, missing. No, I don't, I don't think there is something missing. 24? Right. Part of the reason he's, at, he's still at Villa is because he wanted to stay at Villa. He wanted to help them out of the, the, the championship. Did he? Yes, he did, at 22. If, if somebody 22. had come with a £60 million and, and, offer, and he would he not gone... have said, yes, I, I, I need no, no, to do No, no, listen, that. if somebody had come with a £60 million offer, Villa would have taken it, and Jack would have gone. Jack really will go this summer. I'm absolutely convinced. Well... Jack Grealish will go when the transfer window waves, and he will go to a top, top club. But there's speculation right? now that he might not as he a result will. of the No, I don't, think he, I don't think that will. I've seen through history, Richard, players um, err on the side of stupidity. I, listen, I was one myself. I'm not sitting here and saying to everybody, I was holier than thou. I never went out and did things I shouldn't, drank at the wrong time. Well, no, I wouldn't have done that, but I, did, I, went, out and enjoyed, I went out and enjoyed myself. <laughs> yes, I did, but it was a different world back then. Now, today you're right, you have to be disciplined, you have to be responsible, you have to want, Jack wants it. There's no doubt in my mind Jack Grealish wants to be the best player he can possibly be. And I think he will be, when we start back in the new season, whatever that might be, and I hate to say this because of Villa, Jack Grealish will not be at Aston Villa, he will be at a top six club in the UK, in England. That's my opinion. Yes, it's gone against him this, but I don't think... It should be held up um, with it as a stick to beat him with. I understand, and I think there needs to be room to manoeuvre for him, but, but I, I, I think it places seeds of doubt it does. in the minds of those that might be wanting to commit but big money. Sometimes, you know, I, what was it? I mean, I, I remember we were talking that I, 12 months ago, James Madison was in a bit of trouble, and his boss, Brendan Rodgers, backed him. I can't remember what it was he was. I remember he was making headlines for the wrong headlines. Something had happened at Leicester. James Madison, young kid, did the same. I think these, these kids, and they, they are still kids, and we've talked about it, and players have talked about it, we've talked about it. You know, they don't know what to do with themselves now because routine, football routine is just their life. When you take that routine away, they kind of, they're no different from anybody else then. They think, oh, what have I got to do to film a day? Mm. Um, oh, I don't know, because I've never had to film a day on my own very much. Now they're having to fill every day. He made a mistake, a big mistake, Jack. It really annoyed me and it upset me because I, I think he's been unbelievably good this season. Unbelievably good and a really struggling side. And is, there's been a maturity and an authority about him on the pitch. I thought he had sorted himself out, behaviour-wise, off the pitch. If it's me, if I'm looking at him as a potential buyer, I talk to him and I find out if it was just one blip if it was just one error of judgment. Because if it is, then it doesn't stop me wanting them in my team. Matt Critchley joins us from his home on Merseyside. Matt, of course, for being sports regulars, will now is our reporter in the north of England. Yes. I may have been too specific earlier. 
when I said the Northwest, but the yeah, North of England. Mm -hmm. um, lives a little bit like I used the description of Jack Grealish. Here's a guy who does live, eat and breathe his football. Yeah. And is as frustrated as the rest of us, it's not happening. <laughs> but more specifically, because of the area in which he lives. Yeah. Matt, what are people thinking and saying on Merseyside about this enforced break that we're all suffering, if you like? Yeah, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Liverpool fans in particular deeply frustrated, Richard, about the situation. Uh, I think understanding, finally, because of the severity of the, uh, the coronavirus and the impact it's had worldwide. So perhaps uh, rewind the clock two or three weeks to when the, the season was cancelled and there was great panic, great fear. And I think that, that, that feeling has changed, but there's still a huge amount of frustration that after... 30 years Liverpool finally thought they had it in the bag they finally thought they were they were going to be crowned champions just six more points needed to to confirm that and and not only can they not get there there's now the realistic prospect that they might never get there this season at least and then that opens up a whole raft of, of issues of when when that situation might arise again so yeah deep frustration here you know in a wider world of of, of panic and, and everything that's going on in the mm. world right now but um yeah it, it's perhaps understandable after such success throughout the, the 70s and 80s and, and and as i say getting so close this year and and, and not being able to, to get across the line it's um it's a concern at the moment for liverpool fans matt is, is it, tell me what the thought might be at anfield is there, is there a feeling that if it doesn't finish we should still be champions crown champions genuine champions or is there a genuine worry if it doesn't finish, the season and the results and the performances will be null and void and we reset again next season? What's the worry? I, I, I just really, I just don't think we can have a situation where we stop the season and we say whatever the situation was when we stopped is the situation that we finished with. I just don't think that... That, that questions everything we know about football. We're, we're suggesting that people would have won games, that people would have would have not won games, mm. would have gone this way or that way. It, it, it just questions everything we know and love about football. So the, to me, there's, there are two options and two options only, and that's to null and void the season altogether or to try to restart it at some stage. I just don't think we can have a situation where we say that the end, that the situation that we that we had to stop at is, is the end situation and, and Liverpool should be crowned champions because they were in first place. Of course, it's more than likely that they would have won the title. It's virtually inevitable that they would have won the title. But that's just not enough at this yeah. stage. We, we have to have that confirmed or we have to avoid the season. That's, that's the only answer. Is, is there a growing feeling amongst the hierarchy, Matt? And, and I understand Liverpool fans. Of course I do. And I'm, I'm a Coventry fan and I keep... I keep Pointing that it means as much to me that Coventry are top of League One right now yeah, as it does to a Liverpool fan that they're top of the Premier League. We've had 20 years of it. Real hurt. Now, were the season to finish at this stage, we're not coming up. We're not coming up. But is there a feeling amongst the hierarchy at Liverpool that maybe that they're going to have to accept that that is the case, start again and nail it down next year? Yeah, I mean, listen, Liverpool, the hierarchy at Liverpool can, can think what they like. Uh, this situation <laughs> will be ultimately taken out of their control. And that's the, the difficulty, I think, for everybody right now, is that it's so open-ended. We simply don't know how this virus is going to progress here in the UK, is going to progress worldwide. And we don't know how, as and when we're going to be able to resume football on a short, medium, long-term basis. So, of course, there, was, there, is, there will be a plan in place they will be aware that the idea of null and voiding the season is still there. But to my understanding, trying to get this season finished is still very much the number one choice for both the executives in football and uh, the Premier League and the Football Association and everybody else. So to try to finish the season in some way, uh, we've seen plans today that they may go behind closed doors even from the start of May, which seems... No extremely yeah. early i mean we're talking about four weeks from now that that, no. that seems a massively yeah, ambitious nobody. plan with no media no fans nothing there just just games being played so there are all sorts of plans in place but as i say nothing concrete yet and nothing will be agreed and can be agreed without the government's authority without the health authorities saying that they can do it as well and they just can't 
I'll give answers to those questions right now. Matt, one, one thing I was thinking there. Might it be taken out of the Premier League's hands in some respect by, let's say, look at Italy and Spain, two countries in far worse condition than the UK is and, and England is. Now, it seems inconceivable that the Italian Serie A and La Liga will start again this season. It just seems inconceivable with what is going on mm. in those two countries. So, if they null and void those two leagues, two of the biggest leagues in, in the world, two of the Super Leagues, does that put pressure on the Premier League to, do, to go down the same route? Because surely we can't have a situation where the Premier League finishes, but La Liga doesn't and Serie A doesn't. What do we do for next season with Europe if that's the case? Yeah, I mean, that does open up a whole raft of questions about what we do potentially with the Champions League next season. I don't necessarily think that the Premier League has to fall in line with Italy and Spain because each league will have to be treated separately and differently right. depending on the individual situation in that country. We know that this, even until this week there's been football going on still in some European countries. So I think every country does have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and we just have to wait and see what happens in the UK over the course of the next two or three weeks. Although the uh, Deputy Chief Health Advisor did say yesterday that she's expecting that this could last and social isolation and everything to do with this coronavirus in the UK could affect our way of life here for up to six months. Wow. People who are potentially facing lockdown well, for see, six months. See, Matt, so that's, that, that's that, for that me more significant. When we sat on Andy's balcony here yesterday, um, I, I said I, I, I'm just tired of the speculation. I thought it was unseemly that with everything happening as it is, that we're even discussing it. Uh, the reason, second reason we asked you to join us today is I think that applies to you probably more than most. Your wife works for the NHS, doesn't she? How, do, how has that changed life? What, what, what are her thoughts on what's important right now when she leaves home and comes back the same day? Yeah, I mean, my wife is a neurosurgical nurse at Alder Hay Hospital on Merseyside, which if people don't know, that's one of the biggest children's hospitals, not only in the UK, but in the world, one of the leading children's hospitals. So she normally on a day-to-day -day basis is helping out with things that children that have recovered from brain injuries, brain surgery, things like that. And she was informed last week that she'd be going into emergency training into intensive care. And now an intensive care nurse on a hospital like my wife's would normally have, I don't know, 18 months, maybe two years to get up to grips with everything. She's had two days training. So the only word I'd use to describe how she feels at the moment is frightened. She's frightened about what could potentially lie ahead, what sort of decisions and positions she's going to have to be put in in the very near future if we see this virus uh, escalating in the UK as it has in Italy and in Spain. Um, she's really, really concerned about clearly having to move over. You know, Many nurses and medical professionals will be in her position, but she will have to move into a, a speciality that she's not trained in. She's not worked in at all in the past and we'll just have to help out and she is really frightened about that prospect and, and really concerned about about what lies ahead so obviously our thoughts go with her and and every medical professional out there right now throughout the world uh, absolutely who, couldn't who agree are desperately more. trying to help us out of this this situation it, it, but it, it also affects family in general man yes. you, you you're the father of three yeah homeschooling right now how is that going yeah well you, you're Interrupting the first 10 minutes of class, which is conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you two are in trouble already. We've, I think we've missed our science lesson because of this conversation. More so importantly, no Matt, more importantly, Matt what have they taught you? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my, I've, got, I've got an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old. My wow. eight-year-old's already doing fractions, decimal places, long multiplication, division. <laughs> It is an education for me. Yes. Never mind them, I tell you. But it, it, it does, I, I, listen, everybody's life is affected by it, but it, it brings it home, doesn't it, when you start to discuss it in these terms? Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it, it's, not, it's a very difficult situation for everybody, and, and for us, it's, it's manageable at the moment. Things aren't too bad here. It, it, you know, you have to try and look at the positive in any situation, and there are situations and, and, and ours is one where families are spending more time together i think that you know the children are getting used to having me around i'm normally off here there and everywhere at football grounds and you know so there are there are elements that at least we can take a positive from but you know you, you as well as 
as all of us know, we, we want life to go back to how it was as soon as it possibly can. Yes. And it, I, it, get, it goes back to that open-endedness again. We, we just don't know no. how long we're going to have to stay like no. this. If someone said, this will be like this for three or four weeks and then we'll get back to normal, I think we could all accept that. Mm. But it could be three weeks, it could be three months, it could be a year, yeah. we just don't know. You're right. not out and about, but I know you're still working. You've got a programme airing on Being Sports this weekend entitled 30 Years of Hurt. I, I, I rather suspect I know the content, but can you tell us <laughs> a little bit more about the programme itself? Yeah, I mean, it's a programme we were working on with the prospect of Liverpool winning the title imminently. Um, it wasn't necessarily going to be called 30 Years of Hurt originally. We had to have a little bit of a, a time back in the edit suite, uh, remotely, I might add. We were working uh, from home on this one. So, yeah, we, we've got a programme which looks back at the 30 years that Liverpool have failed to win the title since 1990. I mean, the 28th of April 1990 was the last time Liverpool lifted the league championship. So we are getting very close now to that, that 30th anniversary. So it features the likes of uh, John Barnes, Ian Rush, who were part of that championship team back in 1990. We've spoken to Gerard Houllier, who, who talked in detail about the fact that he never thought he could win the title with Liverpool when he arrived. Uh, in 1998. Even we take a different look as well at people like Darren Fletcher and Mark Hughes who've been over with you in Doha in recent times and they give the Manchester United perspective on what they thought about Liverpool and why they didn't win the title as well. So it's, it's not just a Liverpool programme, it's not just focused on Liverpool people, it's, it's the whole footballing world, Sam Allardyce, Martin O'Neill, uh, people like that right. who've given their thoughts on, on why the title has evaded Liverpool for so long. So, yeah, interesting. should be out this weekend. Looking forward to it, Matt. Yeah, very Thank much you for so. taking time out from school to join yes. us today. I don't think I've ever said that previously to no, anybody. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, Thank just, you, though. Just one other thing. As, as the weather changes, I think that grass needs cutting. Yes. So there's another little job for you. you lad. Hey, listen, that... <laughs> That's as good as it gets. Yeah. Not and by the way, either. there's also some weeding needs doing behind you as well, so get on with it. I'll get my gloves on. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great Thanks, talk. Matt. Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe, Matt. Matt Critchley with uh, 30 Years of Hurt this weekend on Being Sports. Uh, thank you for your company again today. Any thoughts, please do get in touch with us either at Being or me, Richard at J. AJ Keys well on, 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 on Twitter. And uh, we'll be back here same time tomorrow, five days a week.